So if I so you could kind of move those uh, two microphones, they're, they're at the top of both of those. If anybody has any questions or comments, questions for me or Dr. Barrett, we'd love to hear if we have any questions or comments. Any concerns that you'd like to express? Yes, thank you. So I just want to know that this is not the first incident that happened in the school year in this employer. That it happened to my child as well, who was sick at the time. And it got to the world. And I told her I was going to have to deal with this for the next few years. Nothing was done. I have to move my child from school because she was being bullied. She was having things said to her about her skin color, and she was also being hit by one of her children. And nothing was done. They said they were going to discuss this with the other child parents, and the other child continued to have to be. Even while they moved her from the class, and she was in this child, they still had another class together, and she's so, every opportunity she had said something to her. And so I ended up removing her from school because they did not. I'm very sorry to hear that, Matt. I apologize to you and your family. More importantly, uh, I would like the opportunity to speak to you more uh, significantly about that. You, you certainly didn't, you didn't bring that to my attention. I would like to have known that. I would like to have helped uh, much more deeply if I could. And I still feel that I can. So if there's an opportunity for us to speak, uh, please, if you're still here, yeah, I'd love to have that opportunity. Perhaps we can schedule a time and talk about it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. It is on. I'd like to know what your policy is for employees of the district regarding racist, bullying, and violent social media posts. Because we know that bullying is not always isolated to just students. So what is your policy regarding employees in the district? Well, it's, we have, it, our district policy uh, is, uh, you know, obviously it has consequences for those kinds of behaviors for, for both students and, and adults. And adults. When it's brought to our attention, we certainly investigate that and look into those matters. Um, so if there's an issue that you need to bring to our attention, certainly let us know. I'm just wondering, do you have official guidelines so that all people in the district know that they are complied by those guidelines? Yes, we do. It's in our policy handbook. And all of our uh, teachers and staff go through training at the start of each school year around harassment and bullying and uh, civil rights uh, opportunities in our school community. Yes, sir. I have a question. My only question is that all the presentations are going to address the root cause of the community, it's not in the school. This is, from my understanding, the generation that had a cold that 30 years my senior, it was pointed out that the root cause of race is on you. How are you going to address that? You have less than one percent. Representing your population, so less than one percent. So it's ninety-nine percent people here who don't care about what they say, don't care to fix it. How are you going to address that? Mountains are very difficult to climb. And to climb a mountain, we need to create a toehold. And what I have control over. But I can, what I can hopefully impact is this school community. And hopefully from this school community, schools are often the lighthouse within a community. And to hope and pray that we can change the behaviors of those who are out of the community or are the older generation, we hope that we can. But what we do know is we can change and help the young people of this community grow and learn to become the kind of people inclusive people that we want and need in our society. So I can't promise you that I can change the community. There's no question that I can't do that. But what I can try to do is what I have just this little tiny bit of control over 
here at Lewis and Porter Central. And that's what I'm trying to do. Racial slurs and bullying and discrimination. Um, so, 
I just wanted you to all know that you're not alone. And um, not a whole lot is being done right now in the East Coast School District. I'm kind of the only advocate right now for my son. Um, so I was hoping that maybe, um, I don't know how much communication superintendents have within the school district, you know, among the school districts. I know superintendent Ross as well. I do too. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any communication between you and Mr. Ross. Um, we're just trying to collaborate. Um, because Easter Aurora is in dire need of, of what you guys have started. Um, and Dr. Barrett, I, I would love to come to Easter Aurora. Uh, hi, my name is Laura Nyder. I graduated two years ago in 2020. Um, I experienced quite a few racially targeted attacks in my time here at Lucy Porter. Um, most of them for myself were on social media. Um, I also have a sister who graduated from the school in 2014. Um, she was also attacked horribly. Um, for many years, most of her school life, and me as well. And I just want to know why you're showing all of these programs, why wasn't anything done sooner if you knew that there was a pattern where kids of color were being attacked by white students? Lauren, I, I remember you I mean, I have a lot of problems with this kind of stuff. I know you do. I apologize to you. Not even students and staff. I want to do I felt at the time that we had, we had, you and I had many interactions over the years for sure. Yes. And I, uh, again, apologize to you for the experiences that you had. I know that they were difficult. And I also. They're really affected by learning at this institution. I mean, a lot. Yeah. I, I also know that the, some of the experiences that your sister had here yes. as well. Uh, I apologize for not. Her name was written. With racial slurs on the back of the wall, and nothing was done about it. I can tell you that we looked into that carefully. But we never really determined who made who wrote those on the walls. And that regardless, regardless, we did. I recognize that both you and your sister, over your years here at Bruce's Supporter, experiencing those behaviors. And I apologize to you for that. And I'm sorry. And I wish that you could have had another experience here, for sure. I thought that even in those days, we had programs. But uh, clearly, we try to continue to grow that program to try to support our students. Uh, we we always learn as we go. But uh, for the experiences that you had, I know for sure uh, that they were difficult for you and your sister as well. And for that, I'm sorry. Thank you. My name is Marlene Smith. I just don't remember the incident. Uh, my name is Marlene Smith. I'm 10 years old. I was a since I'm over 40, which happens around a lot of that time. Um, but one teacher, his parents, came up to me about it and made sure I was okay. Marlene, again, as I said, your, your, your uh, boyfriend, uh, fiance, if you had that experience, I, I apologize to you. I, um, I talked to Mr. Everett about it, and the girl who said, I'm for her safety, and then my cousin was expelled for sticking up for me. Um, and I'm like a five year old, my baby's gonna be one. So in five years, because you're saying it takes to climb a mountain, so almost 10 years it takes you to climb a mountain. I don't wanna wait five more years for that because I want my baby to go here. I'm sitting up for myself and for him and for everybody else. More, I'm sorry to get you and your sister. I'm sorry for the woman that you talked earlier. I'm sorry for all the children that's going to keep happening too. It's not changing. And so you see that change in that difference? It's hard. It's hard to see. We're working at it. Tonight is the beginning of that, uh, Marlene. And again, for that experience that you had, you know, I. And just all I can say to you is how sorry I am. That is still something that uh, is within you and inside you because that's not what we had ever hoped for here at Lucy Park. So for that, I do apologize to you. Okay, sorry, words, sorry, just words. Sure. 
True. And that's what we're doing tonight. Okay. Well, thank you for remembering me for who I am and not for what happened to me. Listen. Um, my name is Sarah, and I'm a student here at Woodward, and I have personally witnessed like, bullying, not so much racially, but bullying in general. I want to know how, like, what the appropriate way of reporting these situations without feeling more, like, feeling more fired, if that makes sense, without being, like, held accountable. Because, like, we're only doing what's right. It's not like we're, you know, Doing anything wrong. So, does that make sense? It does. And, you know, we have our, I, I would say, a key way to do that is through our anonymous tip line on our website where you can kind of detail incidents uh, and kind of tell us some great some detail in that and we can really start to dig into it or into that. But in order for us to to dig into those incidents, we, we just got to know about it. We just but will something be done though? For sure. For sure. For sure. I can assure you of that. It's something that we got to because yeah, I could only imagine how those people are feeling like victims of this. It's, it's, it's wrong. It needs to be, something needs to change. It is 100% wrong. That's why we're starting tonight. But more importantly, we need to know. We can't make it better until we know. Thank you. That's okay. Go ahead. Why don't you come on into the microphone? Sure. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Dan, and we are here in the sports community and in the uh, My favorite is formed through adoption. I'm sorry. It's uh, formed through adoption. And I like to say I'm the only boring white person. And it is encouraging to me. That something is being put in place. Um, we have been nothing but welcomed since we came here. And I am, I'm sorry, oh, is the emotional progress that you're putting in place. Um, we moved from Michigan in the week after. Oh, shit. A week after we moved here, the shootings in our situation and hell. That was a beauty. And we never thought we would have. We lost friends. There are families that will never be the same. And I'm really, really encouraged that you're putting these things in place before something could happen here. We never thought it would happen. We are a team community. We would never have ever happened. But it did. And I'm just really encouraged that you're putting these things in place. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, let's say, uh, I'm a dog in the prison. We won't know it's an unpopular thing. It's an important school district. The prison, others, the school district. Many years ago, we wanted to start a family here. Um, the daughters have come up here their whole lives. <laughs> and they always see up on the side, you know, honor, integrity, respect, and so on and so forth. And you tell the teachers, um, you know, be wise to bully. You see someone being bullied, say something. Problem is, is these teachers now have become so accustomed to it. In the beginnings of it, they turn blind out. I contacted the school on a few occasions regarding bullying. And now it's gotten nothing was taken seriously. It's wonderful that we're doing these things. We're putting these plans in place. But we need to see follow up. Because it's always show honor, respect, uh, various other things. But those are only words of Those are only 
printed and worked on a piece of paper. Yeah, take the time to tell the kids about it. But when it comes down to it, and it's actual bullying category, always see this. That just gets pushed aside. Okay, no problem. It's a little part of it. It's a little more. Well, in this instance, the bully is put right next to my dog. Side by side. And deal. It's a consistent issue. Not only my child, several other children. Say you're going to do something. Follow through. Make sure the teachers follow through. There's more problems created by saying there's an issue with bullying. You need to stop it. Bullying is not okay. But when it's not stopped, you need to do that. That's what you want. Thank you, Mayor. I would agree with you. Yes. I decided to bring Marie to the park because I'm a team park. It's late twenty minutes. I figured I'd bring her when she's the kindergarten, so she grows up with these kids. So these kids wouldn't know any different, right? And truth be told, I stand by that. I think it was the right decision. Um, this is a community problem. This isn't just a new park. Or a problem, you know, they don't see me as too hard. You know, you know, somebody shouldn't say, Well, I don't see color, I think you should. You should. The other night, we were watching our dogs. I don't need to stop us and say, You guys, are you from here? Yeah, the dog mystery guy grew up here. I thought she was being nice, like just trying to have a conversation. It wasn't until after that I thought, oh my God, like, Karen, you the whole lady. What are you doing? It isn't until the people in the community stand up, it isn't until the white people in the community stand up. I spent the parents here. I'm very disappointed. I, I appreciate everyone who's here. You guys are awesome. I thought there was going to be standing room only. I, I really did. Because this is such, obviously, it's very close to my heart. Um, I, I am disappointed in our Lewiston community that more people didn't shut up. We saw it all on Facebook that I'm outraged. Uh, you know, oh, that's so wrong. That's so this. You know, where is everybody? Thank you. So, hi, my name is Natalia Marino. Um, a big problem, too, is not just with the racism, it's with the LGBTQ community. And as a member, I'm a transgender woman. I was sick to come to school every day. And I left because I was terrified of what would happen to me. Every day, something would happen since middle school. And I'm sick and tired of it. It is disgusting the way I was treated. I was too terrified to even go to teachers. I was terrified of that much. So I just want to know like, what other things that you could do to help kids in the LGBTQ community as well, not just the race, but the different well, races. Natalia, first of all, I, I, I applaud your courage. I truly do. Uh, I don't know. I think you're a beautiful person. And you are an important part of the school community. You're an important part of my program, uh, my uh, superintendent's advisory council. You're, you're, you and your brother uh, have a special place with me on that committee. So it, it hurts me inside greatly. And I know that you've experienced these things. I, I know you have. I know that we, I, I know that we have. We have tried to address in some instances some of the uh, issues that you face, but I also know from our conversations that you had these things happen to you in our, in our community as well, just walking down the street. We have our Gay Straight Alliance here at Lewiston Porter. I'm proud of that, I'm proud of the work that Kirk Kierke, Kierke does with that group. 
I'm proud of that our LGBTQ community has a safe haven here at our school, uh, has, a, has an organization uh, that they can go to and work with. Um, but I know how difficult it is. I can only promise you that we will continue to, to, to try to instill in this community respect for everything that everybody brings to the table. And I, I know how difficult it's been for you, Natalia, and I to start. I just want to keep fighting for those kids that need help. Sure. So we chat. Yes, I'm Terry. So I'm so rejected. I am a uh, first grade teacher here that was a supporter for 22 years. And I feel when we leave here today, I am hoping that people feel here can be very uncomfortable. I do, because I feel when people are uncomfortable, I'm hoping and praying that they do things to make themselves more comfortable, right? And a lot of times that takes sacrifice. So when they say, what's, I hear people say, well, Mr. Sir, you know, what are you going to do from here? What's the next step? I feel the difference between a movement and a moment is sacrifice. And I think it starts with not just Mr. Sir, it starts with teacher, myself, administration, I really do hope that you're uncomfortable right now. Because I'm telling you right now, I'm sitting here in my seat and I am uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. So I do hope when we leave here, I hope, and I do believe, Mr. I'm going to be very honest because you and I have had several conversations about this. I do believe that this is a step in the right direction. And I feel the community too. You all have to hold all of us to the fire. You know, not to take these town hall meetings, make appointments with teachers, with administrators, with specific with board members. You have to hold people to the fire. That's the only way change is going to happen. But it's time for all of us. Um, my name is Maya. I'm freshman here, and I also want I just want to say um we should also pay attention to the bullying that is um that is um dying and handicapped students and disabled students. And just, I love the poor Natalia um on her. On um, fact, we should also help the peer students in here as well. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, there, Miss Black. Um, I just want to use it all. I want to be at Mount Clay on the school. That's where I'm from, in the studies. When I came to the board years ago, um, I worked in seventh grade just because it was so bad. Um, a friend of mine grew up on Greek Road. Um, they are of um, African American race. Their house was set on fire. They had to move out of the community. Um, and this has been going on since I was in middle school. My daughter is only my girl. Um, she had dealt with some racist comments being class. I could address it with both principals. Um, she didn't want them addressed, the person that had said something. Being she was one of the only kids in the classroom at the time of color, she felt like it would bring more attention to her. So sometimes those kids can't be addressed because she, you know, these kids might feel like they can target it more. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Now. Truly, I am. And more importantly, if she's still with us and remote, let's talk about an opportunity to get her back on campus, get her back in our community, and let you and your family know that we can create a safe environment for your daughter to be here and, and help her understand that by her saying something, 
will not only help her grow as human, but also those that are hurting her as well. So we really do want you to continue that conversation with the principals. You can certainly continue that conversation with me, but we most importantly want you to have back on this campus without question. So please consider that conversation. Please reach out. It's okay. Um, I'm a 97er. So not not new to me through that experience. Um, and then it's a middle school prom. It's a high school prom. Kids are me. I just want that to be known that this is something that we as parents also have to work on. We as parents have to instill. in their words and in their actions. I also moved back into this community because my family members, my new, my former family is a mixture of family. My kids are very Christian, and this could have just as easily been my 12 year olds in sixth grade or my next year old daughter in fourth grade. For me, this is personal. And I believe that representation matters. Yeah. At our school, and I come to our events, and I look around the room, I don't see a lot of people like me. I don't see administrators that look like my kids. I don't see teachers that speak the language that embrace, not necessarily don't embrace what my kids are, but in the lectures, in the choice of materials that are being taught in the classroom, what resources are being used. So I want to know what differences are going to be made to hiring representation. Not that you have control over New York State curriculum, but you have to have control over what's taught in the classroom. Not just these external programs, but the in the classroom education to help students work through these issues. Let's not read texts that were written in 1960 or 40s that teach racism and how to combat it. Let's talk about the texts that are available to our kids today. That are going to help bring in people of color of different abilities, different backgrounds to help set the stage for creating a more inclusive environment for our kids. That's how cheating things are. Certainly, problem hiring uh, teachers and administrators of color. There's no question about that. There's, there's a uh, difficult time finding teachers and administrators. Period. And as you know, I just was reading the paper today. My friend Tanja Williams, who's now the, uh, she and I worked together when I was in the city of Buffalo, she's now the superintendent of uh, the Buffalo Public Schools, is working to build in programming to try to bring in more. Uh, teachers and administrators of color to the Buffalo Public Schools. It's difficult because there's not teachers and administrators of color that are pursuing education. And we've got to start to work with our local uh, universities to really encourage those opportunities. I know Niagara University is working works closely with the city of Niagara Falls on so many issues and it is a pipeline for students to get to that university, but it needs to be more. Uh, similar problems in Buffalo State would be as well. It's certainly something we recognize. And you probably saw some of the books that were displayed on that, on that uh, PowerPoint that Mrs. Larson had. I think you may have noticed a more diverse selection of reading materials. We continually try to grow those reading materials, but I hear what you're saying. 
will certainly continue to work with Dr. Lyon, the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Technology. GI are often talking about diversity and inclusive opportunities within the curriculum to move those ideas forward. But I hear what you're saying. So thank you. Hi, um, I have three daughters in the district um, that are out to school and middle school. Um, I myself have volunteered for many years as a girls on the coach at the PEC. And I know as a multi-age parent that there are beautiful relationships that are built at that level. Um, I had to be a daughter that went all the way through grade. Um, the challenge happens everywhere once they hit the middle school level. Um, I'm a middle school teacher in the neighborhood district, and we see it as well. As a teacher, um, I don't always have a clear idea of what will happen when I try to diffuse a situation in my classroom using any sort of practices. I'm part of that community in my building because in our building, we don't always have a clear follow through. And it's not communicating in an effective way. And I think we as a community need to be able to trust the system again. And so maybe opening up those lines of communication um, from the administration to the faculty and to the community at large. When these things happen, these are the steps that we will proceed with whether it's a case by these basis, but even a general matrix of these are the things that might happen, this is how we're going to proceed when these actions are taken. Because we need to build that trust. We need to know that when something happens in my classroom, and I'm sure the same as the teachers I know that many these teachers well, something will happen when we take care of them in the classroom. Um, I have two, two of my own our students are also, um, you know, in the special needs community. And um, as a parent, I've sat in all of these orientation meetings at the high school with all of these wonderful honors programs that are available. I'm thinking, that's not my kid. That's not my kid. My kid's not going to be able to do that. This, the unified basketball thing is the first time that my daughter has been able to feel some ownership in this community, and it's an exciting for them. Um, but I, I think that we as a community need to do better at engaging students of lots of different levels, lots of different um, cultures and ethnicities and colors and genders and whatever, but we need to know what this is actually going to follow through so that we can begin to trust the system. Yes. Hello. Oh, no. My name is Hayden Nero. I graduated from the board last year and um, I went to do a semester of college in Pittsburgh. And obviously, um, as an alumni of the board, I still know um, a good deal of what's going on. My girlfriend is the president of the Base Airlines Club, so she fills me in on stuff that goes on. Um, and during my time at the university, um, certain things like racism, homophobia, anything like that, it just was not tolerated whatsoever. You had a scholarship above, you'd be expelled. So, my question is that when it's the same students, I know which students they are, I'm sure you know which students they are, and when it's the same students over and over again that keep repeating offenses, why harsher action isn't taken. Me there, and it's it's kind of cheap. Like I, I feel embarrassed sometimes hearing about that. It's disappointing. It doesn't surprise me necessarily because I've gone here my entire life and I've seen a whole plethora of <laughs> coming or um, occurrences that happen, and I just. It just baffles me that the same kids can be getting away time and time again. And I just wondered what's going to happen to them. 
I'd have to know the specific incident with a specific kid. I can only I can only assure you that uh, there are I can show you the disciplinary report. There are consequences that happen in this system. There is no question. I understand that there are students who are repeat offenders. There are there's no question about that. And we continue to try to fight over them because as a public school, we are here to educate all of those children. And I have some students that we are now educating off campus because of the consequences that have been unfortunately have been given because of their behaviors. But that ultimately is the ultimate goal. But in a public school, we are required to educate those students whether they have consequences or don't. Now, that doesn't, I can assure you that consequences are a part of our way that we go about managing student behaviors. There is no doubt about that. Oftentimes, and I hear this all the time, you are continually trying to work with a student to try to help them become a better person. But I recognize what you're saying. And certainly, as an administrative team, we're hearing all of the words that are being said tonight. And it's certainly going to be, obviously, debriefing from this evening. Uh, and so we can only help to grow from some of the commentary that you're expressing as well. And I can assure you that we will. So thank you. Um, hello, my name is Rafasta Williams. I work here at the Village. I'm a parent, and I understand that I have two older kids that have been in the board, and my almost 26 year old, the first time that they were beaner, when he started reading. So I know, I know where we're coming I also want to say that as worried as we all are about our kids, things are being done. I see it every day. Somebody made a racist remark about my son that I didn't even know anything about. And I had Mr. Allen come down to me and sat with me for almost half an hour and talk to me and you know, express to me how he felt and how the actions that you took and brought the kids in and talked to them and stuff. And what did you really mean when you said they wanted to get my kid into this cake and kids club? It's 2022, we're still using that word. We are, we are still using it. Kids are using it. But things are being done. Mr. Albert, Mr. Ingram have multiple patients sat down with me and said, this is what went on. This is what's going on. And I'm sure that they're overwhelming every day with everything that's going on. So I understand that we get angry and we think nothing is being done. Because I'm being angry. There's times when I just want to fire the handle and beat up on the beer. But I just want you guys to also hear that they are trying to do their job. Good evening, my name is Michael Wall. Uh, I am not a really long resident of this community. My wife, except for Miami, except for a little high age, I live on the eastern seaboard of a lifelong resident. When we settled back in Western New York, uh, we started in Wilson for one year and ran out of there with Lewiston ever since four boys uh, through the system. We have graduated, we got a sixth grade and fifth grade. This hasn't been said, and this can be responded to. If my full intention of coming here today was just to be ears, but my adrenaline was going, and it was something that I wanted to get off my chest. Um, Mr. Casario and, and the panel, Mr. Casario gets ahead and respond. I give you credit. You've got a lot of fun. Thank you. And the, the note is to be made that. This is not just a Lewiston problem. I'm not an apologist for Lewiston. It is a crazy problem. It is not just a Lewiston problem. I was a city kid. I, was, I went to a school that was 80% majority. I played football. I 
the school had a super fan of Jordan. So I get the full spectrum of experience. And even today, you get kids, they're never shut up. They're always wearing it, they're always plugged in. They're, you know, we had a beef, we got out of school, we got off the bus, we settled it there. Now these kids are at the dinner table on Instagram with other kids, and there's just such ammunition for them to, to get to a point where the hate comes into the school. But we have to rewind it, and it was addressed earlier by the woman. I didn't hear her name, but I appreciated it. Families. You know, it's not our responsibility to let our kids go to school and have the administration, school board, and teachers raise your kids. I'm going to go off on a tangent. I'm not sure. um, but you see, my, my children didn't experience racism for or against. They were three of them in the bully, and we've gone through it. And you know, it's not my responsibility or my duty to put you guys in the guys. I'm a parent. I have to raise my kids, I have to educate my kids, and they have to have their experiences. You can't put them in vaults. They've got to have experiences, but I applaud you because those other districts, even the woman in East Aurora, there are other districts that are not addressing the situation as, as we've seen it. No one's addressed it this significantly, and I applaud you for that. Um, we, we all want to see results, and we're all hoping results come, but it's going to be time, and it's not just the school's fault. Thank you for your time. I just wanted to address the thing that you said about administration having people of color. Um, thank you. Getting jobs and different things. And um, I was part of the selection process. I was following the different come in and actually interview six individuals that had qualifications to take a position at Google. They were all great, they all had great qualities, and one out of the six from the republic. She was by far the best. Um, she was very, out of all of us, we, we had our conversation. She was talked with one other person. That other person was a relative of a staff member, a white staff member. Unfortunately, the woman of color did not get the position, but there's another process that to be let go. That the internal members for. I can't say why she wasn't in the position, but there was opportunity. Um, however, you guys chose to go with somebody that was a family. So I just want to let we talk about giving women of color or men of color an opportunity. In my eyes, you know, you guys fail. I've been doing Yes. Hello. I was wondering why I was involved with this, but I want to say something. Does anybody here know that a body that can have a diversity kind of city in their education? I would like to ask the administrators if they know. If you can say, if just like how you teach your students to have future. Days to be well behaved. What is the return on investment for having a diversity in the city? In the school? What's the return on investment yes. of teaching? What, yes, what, 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 what value does it bring to the and the community when you have diversity? I don't want it to bother because I am a product. Diversity, and it wasn't my house. So, my name is Gloria McKenzie, job practice, and go follow me. I grew up, I went to college, and because I grew up in a very multicultural environment with the seventh and eighth, when I graduated from the University of Houston, Texas, and I spoke Spanish. I got a job. 
I made in an alley cat all over the world. I have gone all over everywhere in South America, all on a business trip, all on a business trip, because I have a passport. I have friends in Chile, I have friends in Cuba, I have friends in Mexico. And so when all my white American colleagues were afraid to go to Colombia, my company would look at me and say, you're going to Colombia. Guess what? I wasn't afraid to saw that I grew up in an environment of diversity. I I made, I've been to Colombia. I made the most of it. I made it. My husband is not going to say for the instances where if he has more academic credentials than I do, but I made the higher breadwinner because I have a global the, um, and diversity in the city. I've been in Budapest in um, having food and I have to be polite about the food they're giving me even though I don't like it. So what, what you need to understand is diversity inclusion will result in higher patients. Because I tend to be get higher paying jobs because I have a diverse. I used to have a boss and be like, I will see you in Stockholm at 8 o'clock on Monday. I don't give a shit on you. You might have been I grew up in a very diverse and knew what to do. I even have friends all over the world. So, in understanding, until parents understand that having a 3.8 GPA doesn't mean anything if you're going to the corporate world and touch your colleagues there, even though they don't want it, you get brought up. You also, also are not going to have. Even if you have a high GPA and my friend Sandra Lyon, my colleague brings her curry and puts it up in the office and you see, you, you cry in this glass of wine because that smell, you will be fired. You understand? My I come from corporate America and I come from Texas, which is supposed to be very Republican. I moved here in 2019. I worked even in Curacao in a refinery with Pedavesa. Not many Americans in the past would get to go into a refinery and go with Pedavesa. But because I spoke Spanish and I was American, the global entry, quick charge, and security clearances, I went everywhere. But here in Western New York, I haven't been able to find one more than six months. And the salary that I made here is what I made in 2009. So yes, my I have a white husband, I have a biracial child. She is going to a private school, but even in that fancy private school, one of her students, one of her friends has been given, uh, who is the only other black child there, has given the whole his whole white friends a class this word and the N-word. So it's, I think it's more of a Western world problem because they're not aware. Of the value, I don't think administrators are aware of the value, the monetary value, the return on investment when you can work in any culture with any group of people and still bring high value. And that's the thing that I'm missing from these conversations. Until parents understand, 3.8 GPA is not enough to be able to make if you're going to go to Sweden and spend. Two of three hundred dollars on the company credit card by Optimo, which is at a hundred percent, and then don't come to to meetings in the morning because of the job. That's what the Americans used to do. And all the all the Europeans that are global to or all, all around the world are trying to why the American kid who is behaving like that, and that's because even though he was upper class, he never went anywhere. He didn't have a class. Job. And when you finally got on a business class flight to Europe, he had to show off and then he could come and do his job. So, again, diversity in the city brings money to the table. The fact that and it makes you a good manager, you become an you get to understand people, and you make money. As for me, I'm going back to where I can make money because in Western New York, a person, a uh, property, Bourgeois and third generation educated, a person like me who's boisterous, who's confident, and I'm also a technical 
person. So my goal when I go to Chicago is to give guidance. So here in West New York, you know, our spoken companies that women are not, they have no value. So I'm going back to where I have And this is one of the problems of West New York because we don't, if you understand the world, it's a global world, and you need all the qualified people to get. It doesn't matter what color you from. We need more qualified people. And the only way you can do that is to be inclusive with diversity. And as a manager, you will be managing people who are LGBT, LGBT, who are binary, who are disabilities, and having that experience from the beginning will add money in your pocket because you will be able to manage these people well and bring value. That's all I'm saying. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm a proud black man living in Bruce, New York, married to that redhead over there. Uh, raising two beautiful biracial children. And overall, but overall, I have a really positive experience. Uh, somewhat surprising. But there was an incident a couple of years ago where my proud biracial white student son came over. And we had very candid conversations about race. Right. We have to have a process to be off to where we need to be. And we're both college educators, so we need, again, our custom to have a very frank conversation. We bring that up. And you can imagine our surprise when our son came home and said, uh, who's accustomed to drawing portraits of our family. I was usually in you know, black crayon, and my wife was on these yellow. And this one day, all and show us a picture, and we were all peach. And I said, Well, this is strange. Usually I'm a black you know, figure in, in your family portrait. So, what, what was different today? And he said, Well, my teacher said we had to use the peach crayon. I said, Well, that's, that's different. That doesn't quite comply with the conversation you've had and, and your, your history of being a fine artist in the fifth grade at the time. Now it has a very different look at what is going on. And so I had to kind of hold out my life from getting on the phone and starting to make her phone calls. And I had to check myself. I had a black man in America. I had to check myself for a second. So we called the teacher the next day and said, help me understand. I know you're a veteran teacher. We've met you. I know your intentions are good, but help me understand why you told your classroom to use a peach crayon. There was a long pause. And she said, Mr. Bragg, Ms. Bragg, I'm so sorry. I'm, I, I'm used to kids coming into my class, you know, making their mom purple and the dog green and being a little unrealistic. So I'm trying to bring a sense of realism to their artwork. And in my haste, I said, use a peach crayon. And so we, we called her in. I call her out. We're trying to call her and say, I. I respect that. I can't imagine what the experience is teaching the classroom. I can't imagine. I know what it's like if you be. I can't imagine what you all do. But, and I understand your intentions were good. But you have to understand that you have it. You're a veteran teacher, and you, you weren't thinking, you weren't reflecting on the true diversity, the values of your school. And you said, use a peach crayon. Totally disregarding me and my family. And while your intention was good, the impact still involved you stepping on my toe, right? I still have a sore toe, despite your good intentions. So you have to call people in, and that was part of the lesson for us, is to pause for a moment, engage with our son, and then reach out to the teacher and try and understand what the hell and the idea of intention versus impact is so real, and the teachers need to understand it. I get they're having a major effect, but they need to reflect for a moment on the actions and how it can impact others. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with you. Students should be able to choose the color that they wish for their mom and dad. There's no question about that. I'm sorry that experience happened to you. 
I'm glad you did reach out to the teacher and try to help her grow as well. I hope she did grow from that. But I am troubled by that story. Just yes. Hi. Uh, my name is goes to school where he's probably one of two black children in school. So I take my son to a park one day. And this is where the African American kids play. So he's out here playing and all of a sudden some white kids come. He starts playing with the white kids, the black kids, and runs over to play with the black kids. I say this because we pretend to talk about the color line, but my child saw color. He didn't just see color, he saw what he was comfortable with. So when you get to know people, you become comfortable with people. And I want to say to the teachers here that have overlooked the bullying in the school, you are the responsible. I tell my kids in my classroom, 
these are different types. Here we are talking about appreciation. In Niagara Falls, my classroom is really not because of just the But I explained to my children, bullies are people who are cowards. They want to make you feel bad to make themselves feel good. So let's start teaching that group of kids. Everybody should be proud of themselves and not have to dim somebody's life just to give us a shot. I uh, just didn't I just feel uh, the people who are saying that I'm going to have people who need a lesson on culture and confidence. Uh, people that try to show up today are not the ones that have honor. Uh, I wanted to have this important to address uh, this issue amongst people who wouldn't come here. Uh, as I said, we're going to be able to do the behavior, uh, and something needs to be done to stop it. Uh, in an ideal world, that solution is very important. Our world is not ideal. Uh, as such, it was important to require that solution, that the education, which can change to reflect the current state of things globally, uh, and racial conditions, and disciplinary action should be reflected in that one of the nature of the uh, Students should not feel that attention is fun. And that AI is easier than school. Thank you. Everyone should know that it's not just me listening. It's my administrative team, and uh, we are certainly going to take everything that's been said tonight uh, very seriously to heart, a debrief, ensure that we are continuing to move and go forward uh, with the issues that are placed on our table. Yes. Yes. It's going to be done with cell phone usage. Who are I can see. I'm sorry? What do you mean to be done with cell phone usage in the lower grades? The high school, the middle school, and everything. I know there is a new cell phone in the class. Correct. I don't know if there is a new cell phone in the class. There's a home call. There's school calls. She's contacting me on school calls when she forgets, when I forget. These kids are told to leave their cell phones in the lockers, but they bring them to the class. They place them under the desk, and the teachers are on the sitting there watching videos and songs and what the high school each other. And I'm really going to say a lot of kids, the teachers can't have to leave somebody Why are they in school? Sir, I, I can tell you that uh, while you represent a line of thinking with regard to cell phones, there are many, many families that feel that it's important, it's exceedingly important for their child to have that cell phone. It's a lifeline and it's an important communication tool. And we get just as much pushback from families when we try to not have cell phones in school. And by the time a child becomes 12, 13, 14 years old, we one of the things we need to do is teach responsibility. I don't think that you and I are going to ultimately see eye to eye on the cell phones, but I respect what you're saying. I don't know what is certain that. Um, like my, my daughter is before school activities, after school activities, that's why she still continues to use the school phone call something she has. Personally, do I think it makes a job? No. I had a conversation with Two and a half years ago, before COVID, and then when COVID hit, would express an issue with an app of yours, Seesaw. You looked at me and laughed and said, There's no problem with Seesaw. It gets a growing review from everybody that uses it. Lo and behold, I talked to several teachers and parents who are all having problems, but you brushed me off like I was nuts. Yet, that's the majority of people that I spoke to had issues. I don't think it is. I think this is nothing more than a sticky note on the computer. Yes. And I hope you prove it all. I really do. Thank you for your feedback. I appreciate it, sir. <coughs> Anybody else have a comment? I have uh, 
Yes, go ahead, please. It's uh, after 30, so unless anybody else has another comment, we'll call this the last comment. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the beginning of the presentation. There was a about emotional training, about people regulating emotions at the elementary school level. Um, is there a component to uh, like we train these students to or, or teach the students to analyze the body language? That's important to know because you can clearly tell that someone's upset if we're happy based right on their body language. There's a fantastic book called. What everybody is saying by George Merrill. He was an FBI agent and he analyzed body language criminals to determine if they were telling the truth, if they were nervous, so much more. So, is there a, like a study of body language with that person? I'm not familiar with that particular uh, name. I don't know if second step or some of the programs, but we'll certainly take a look at that. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. What he was talking about with uh, the witness topics. I was wondering if you could elaborate on whether the teacher is solely in charge of those topics, or is there administrative overreach, or how the topics are. Uh, yeah, they're developed collaboratively uh, with the administrative team and the teachers. It's an ongoing process, largely rooted in the restorative practices. We really are trying to uh, promote that slow role, and that's been a so this body language that he's talking about would be uh, noticed in the end program? To a certain extent, I would think. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not familiar with what the program is talking about. I have to look further into it. So maybe you could elaborate more on what the NEST program does. If the NEST is not a program. It's an opportunity for kids and teachers to come together to really focus on the social emotional growth with each other. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Just, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, Dr. Barrett. Uh, I really appreciate your guidance and insight. And I guess I'm just curious as to what's and not only what's next, I think this is wonderful, and I think we need to check the people for that conversation. I think it becomes something that so feel like parents who want, I want my kids to be change agents, and I want them to feel safe doing that. And I think that maybe that's common to me as parents, from parents who have not. And what's tangible that is able to do that? So I hope that we get some guidance in the future. And we continue this conversation. All right, so with that, I'll leave you with these words from Dr. King. People fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated. With each other. We've had a difficult conversation tonight, for sure, and I've appreciated all of the feedback that we've heard. I know that there are some people in our community that are hurt. I recognize that. We heard from some of them tonight. And from this opportunity tonight, we are going to continue to move forward, continue to offer programming, continue to offer more nights like this, but then also offering specific programming within our schools as well. And again, um, we're thankful for you being here tonight. Have a safe drive home. Thank you.